Dean Del Mastro is being investigated by Elections Canada. The former cabinet minister admitted that he went over the legal spending limit and accepted corporate donations, something the law says he can't do. But she has a, I think, a high mountain to climb to persuade people that all of these um, expenses that she falsely and improp improperly claimed was all just a big mistake. An appointment which should never have happened in the first place is turning into one of the most outrageous displays of Stephen Harper's entire tenure. The RCMP decides today, speaking of Nigel Wright, to launch a criminal investigation into the Wright Duffy check. You know, I think the difficulty the Prime Minister has, Peter, is that if his party is tainted by corruption and he doesn't know all of the answers, why is it still in power running the country? That is a great way to start off today's show. It is indeed. Harper I, Canada Day. Yes, it's Canada Day. And we're here for you, Radio Free Canada. I'm Darren Howard. I'm Robert Nisbet. It's too much fun in 15 minutes. It's called the News Quickie and is guaranteed to satisfy you every time. Of course, some limits in place. We're going to run clips about Harper and his nightmare. It's all right here for you. It's Radio Free. Let's do this one because it's cool. Statistics Canada says the country's economy grew by just 0.1% in April, marking the fourth consecutive month-on-month -month gain, but also the smallest increase. Recently, Prime Minister Stephen Harper said he will not let the country slip back under his leadership. Still, analysts warn the reality is the real estate market is still struggling. Canadians are deep in debt, averaging about $27,000 in consumer debt alone and the Canadian stock market is sluggish. Philippe Caron is part of the HEC Investment Club. He says Canada's stock market primarily involves natural resources such as energy and material stocks, but key factors like the Keystone Pipeline and American shell production have changed investments. Canada relies heavily on the United States economy, which is currently still trying to recover from the recession. About 70 percent of Canadian exports are to the U.S. The U.S. stock market is making gains compared to when the recession hit, but the dollar is still weak. Well, that's why Canada has struggled um, during the, the last couple of years, in my opinion, because, uh, well, their, their uh, trade balance or uh, current balance uh, diminished a lot and is now negative. Canada's economy had its best month for job creation in more than a decade, adding 95,000 new jobs. Statistics Canada will issue its second quarter GDP report in late August. Ashante Hathaway, Press TV, Montreal. Ah, uh, yes, Press TV talking about stuff that CBC doesn't. Well, you know, they won't talk about how our economy is very fragile, no. No, no, they're not going to talk about the fact that the economy is made up out of nowhere by fractional reserve lending. Yes, indeed, the phrase of the Harper Day is fractional reserve lending. Banks make money up out of nowhere, and if you hear they say the word economy, it means bank profits. Yeah, because the sad thing is we have to go outside the country to find actual reporting on our own economy. I know. It's kind of crazy because the world is watching. We're part of the Internet solution, but you are way more important than us. You're the person thinking of starting your own radio station, speaking the truth, and standing up for what's right because that's what we're doing. Remember, we're there to back you up. What do you got for me, brother? Well, we have to continue more stories about our Canadian economy. <laughs> Holding up your fingers like that. Economy. Reporting the bank profits. Let's run this. At the height of the global economic downturn, the Canadian economy was deemed to be as safe as houses. Ironic, then, that there are now concerns the housing market could drag down Canada's seemingly resilient financial sector. The International Monetary Fund warns that the economy could be exposed to a housing bubble and that housing prices are 10% overvalued. Despite the warning from the IMF, there's still a bullish sentiment here, particularly at the high end of the market where interest from foreign buyers is greatest. Canadian lenders have been relatively prudent compared to their American and European counterparts, but whilst the rest of the world learned lessons and drastically reined lending in, it's been business as usual in Canada as consumer prices creep up and pay levels plateau. Canadians are relying more and more on the equity in their homes to stay afloat. 
It sounds all familiar. The borrowers here are adamant they won't go the same way as the U.S. The Canadian government, though, is not so confident. It's already acknowledged that lending is getting out of control. Measures were rushed in last year to curb spiralling mortgage debt, including limiting loan terms to 25 years. And the IMF suggests that more action might be needed if household debt levels keep rising and house prices stagnate. Christian Yeo, CCTV, Toronto. And don't forget that the IMF brings poverty wherever it goes. Oh, and they are definitely an agent of chaos. Yes. Okay. Uh, what they do, the IMF, the International Monetary Funds, is is they come in, they give you loans made up from nowhere, and then demand that you make your citizens suffer by overtaxing and paying off made-up loans, just like the debt clock right here in B.C. And the thing is, they don't even loan money to the governments of the countries they're loaning money to. They loan it to their own corporations I know. to build huge infrastructure projects. Yeah, like water projects when they got kicked out of Brazil. They got The IMF uh, supports major corporations, and people don't really think about that. They think that, that somehow they get real money that solves real problems. It doesn't work that way. No, it doesn't. Okay. Uh, we're covering the issues right now. Our debt clock is in Kelowna, and we're going to go out in the streets a little bit later on today. We are recording this on July the 5th, though, so we're hopefully we've got some pictures showing us doing our thing. Exactly. Okay, so I hope you get out there. And remember, we're going to give you some more pesky statistics. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you mean those things that Harper hates? You got it. Yes, facts and statistics, once again, things that a conservative is allergic to. A recent report by the CIBC suggests the future generation of Canadians is experiencing chronic unemployment. The youth unemployment rate is more than double the unemployment rate for Canadians aged 25 and older. And the statistics reveal that for the Canadians in the age group ranging from 15 to 24, more than 400,000 are either jobless or not in school. That's one in 10 Canadians. The labor market is not necessarily showing signs there will be improvement in the near future. After the recession, corporations downsized significantly. And as a result, recent graduates lacking experience were left without job opportunities and mounting debt. Numbers reveal Canadian youth are more educated than previous generations. Students are going to school longer. More than 40% of Canadians ages 20 to 24 are enrolled in school. So who is to blame? Some critics say the education system needs refining, where students can get real-world experience. Others believe education is becoming less about preparing the student for the workplace and more about a financial gain for universities. Tuition fees have risen since the last decade. Today's student pays twice as much for an undergraduate degree than they did in the 1990s. The Canadian Federation of Students says university graduates on average have $27,000 worth of loan debt. Ashante Hathaway, Press TV, Montreal. Darn those pesky statistics. They show that the, <laughs> government, the Harper government are not the strong stewards of the economy that they claim they are. Uh, let's see now. Accountability? Mm, no. Transparency? Mm, no. Uh, let's see now. Fiscal responsibility? Mm, no. Can I say the word $3.1 billion? Can we oh. say that again? <laughs> you I mean, mean that uh, missing anti-terrorism money. That's right. But, uh, you know, it didn't go to any place that was bad. But, then you know, they've got millions of dollars and they're safe at the PMO's office. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> well, recently, we want you just hang on a second. Just hang on. Uh, I just want to mention Generation Jobless. Get on CBC. Watch it. 50% unemployment rate for youth, guaranteed 27% or 50% uh, or $27,000 in debt. That was ridiculous. When I went to college, the average college student enrolling was worth $30,000. Yeah. Now they're worth $3,000. <laughs> wow. I, we're moving forward, though, aren't we? Yeah, this economy thing's working. What yeah, you got, brother? Well, yeah, so, well, recently, Mr. Harper was in Europe at the GA trying to negotiate a trade deal for Canada. Oh, what? Pray tell was that? That would be known as CETA. For those that don't haven't heard of it or don't know what it is, we present this. The Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement. It's a complex name, but its effects will be simple, decisive, and ugly. When our government signs CETA this fall, the way we do business and the way we live will change forever, and it won't be good. 
CETA is another one of Harper's corporate rights pacts, essentially. He calls it a free trade agreement, uh, they call it an economic partnership agreement, but really it's about taking government out of our lives, taking options out of our lives, and handing those options over to multinational companies. CETA is a law that guarantees the right for corporations to make money, even if that means selling off our essentials to life, like water resources and food safety. CETA puts our lives in the hands of the lowest bidder, often a distant foreign company whose sole purpose is to turn a profit. It's an agreement that's mired in secrecy. Our government doesn't want us knowing what our lives will look like once CETA is a reality. CETA is another way for Harper to hastily sneak in binding changes before we can react. But there are other ways to be a profitable nation with a healthy economy and a population not scrambling to make ends meet. Our cities can create jobs by spending locally. They can protect the environment by spending locally and keeping services public. The Harper government doesn't like that. He's against that, those kinds of policies and see it as a way to constrain cities and constrain provinces in what they can do. And absolutely anybody with an intellect or a, mer or a memory understands free trade is the worst thing ever. It's not free and it's not fair trade. No, not at all. But they, you know, they have the propaganda statements and, of course, you know, big commercials to say that they're doing good. And, of course, all we have to trade really is our energy and our resources. Right. So you want to run this? Well, of course, Let's... because, you know, this is important to BC people as well. Yeah. Okay. So check this out. From the air, West Shore Terminals isn't too difficult to spot. Located just south of Vancouver, it's Canada's busiest coal port. Today, a vessel from China arrives to pick up a load of coal. China now burns nearly half of the world's coal. BC's three coal terminals have spent millions on expansion to take advantage of the opportunity. It's also led to concern over coal dust as trains travel through the city to get to the terminals. We think we live in this green region that we're progressive, that we've got all these best interests in, in, um, in mind, and we're poised to become the biggest exporter of coal, and so therefore the biggest exporter of global warming pollution in North America. BC extracts and ships metallurgical coal, a key ingredient for steel making. We ship it to Asia, and it returns in products as diverse as cars to iPads. To reduce dust, coal is sprayed repeatedly during its journey to the city and before it's loaded at the port. Environmentalists say their biggest concern is the growth of U.S. coal shipments through Canada. American thermal coal is still used for generating power in 40% of the world, particularly developing nations, making it a major source of greenhouse gas emissions. The debate over coal isn't just about the environment, but about Canada's natural resource development in an increasingly Asian century. Critics say the present debate means coal, oil pipelines and natural gas resources will never be developed, impacting future generations of taxpayers. They won't have had the, the job opportunities, they won't have had the economic spin-offs. Whether it's coal, oil or natural gas, the debate surrounding Canada's resource development is expected to continue and remain heated. Jazz Joel, Global News. Oh, and there's the story that the conservatives don't want to hear. Well, no, because, you know, we don't want to be... We're not responsible for global warming. No, no, but no. Ask the people in Alberta how that's working <laughs> out for them. Uh, don't you wish you would have gotten off fossil fuel a couple decades ago? We're urging you to get out there, tell the truth, and make sure that it sticks. Never stop telling the truth. We need to get off oil. 100%. I'm Darren Howard. And I'm Robert Nisbet. we got another segment coming up right away on Stephen Harper's Nightmare. Thanks for joining in, and thanks for checking out our facts. Remember, we don't make commercials that say trust us. Oh, no. This is Radio Free Canada. We'll be right back after this. <laughs> 